We are in our November series that we've been doing this month called Echo Chamber, and, and the importance or the significance of this series is to remember, to understand the faithfulness of God in our life. And uh, we've been t- talking about the faithfulness of God this whole month, and nothing is more uh, exciting and encouraging to me than talking about God's faithfulness. And, you know, the idea of an echo chamber is that sound is not lost. Sound comes back, and it's, it's reverberating. And uh, the idea behind this series, Echo Chamber, is that the faithfulness of God is not lost in our life. We know he has been faithful, and we know that he continues to be faithful, and we need to continually remember his faithfulness in our life. In fact, it's imperative that we are remembering and meditating on God's faithfulness because if we don't, we run the risk of living a very passionless and mundane faith life. And uh, none of us want that. That's not God's heart for us. It actually encourages our faith and stokes our faith and helps us to grow as we remember his faithfulness. So we're taking this month doing it, and today is going to be no different. Uh, I'm actually excited about today. I feel like I got a word from the Lord for us, Uh, and I'm going to start right in with my text verse out of Joshua 24. I'm going to ask you guys to stand with me if you would, please as we like to do here in honor of reading God's word together. Uh, This is the very last chapter of Joshua. So Joshua's about to die, and God has been completely faithful to the children of Israel, bringing them out of Egypt, through the wilderness, into the promised land. And Joshua, before he dies, he gives them this great exhortation. Starting in verse 14, he says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away your gods, your forefathers worshipped, beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage of scripture from the the book of Joshua. The title of my message today is Our Choices and God's Relentless Faithfulness. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We love you. We are so thankful for your presence in this place, Lord, and we pray that you would do in these next few minutes what only you can do, God. I pray that you would take my words, let let your words flow into our hearts today, God. Anything that's of me, I pray that it would fall on deaf ears, but God, whatever is of you, Lord, let it produce and change and transform our lives for your glory, God. We thank you that you love us so, so much. We're here to honor you, to love you, and to worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank the Lord. All right, so we're talking today about our choices in relationship to God's faithfulness. You know, choices matter. Amen? The choices we make matter in life. They can either bring regret or they can bring rejoicing. Right? We've all made choices that have brought regret. We've all made choices that have brought rejoicing in our life. I think, you know, just superficially, I think back to the 90s. It was when I was still cutting my teeth in life. You know, I was in my 20s and uh, made a lot of decisions, a lot of bad ones. Um, one of them was that um, I followed the trend of the day for men's haircuts, which was the mullet. You know, business in the front, party in the back. Uh, have lots of regret for that, mostly because there are cameras that have taken pictures that are still evident. But not the worst regret I have in life, but not one of my uh, favorite things I've done either. But one of my best decisions I ever made in my life was also in, in the 90s, which was deciding to serve Jesus with my whole life. It was the best decision I have ever made, and it continues to pay dividends in my life. And uh, I have no regrets. I rejoice over that decision every single day of my life. Now, our decisions affect us, obviously, but what we need to remember today is they do not affect whether or not God will be faithful. Okay? He's faithful even in our bad choices. In fact, Paul's second letter to Timothy He said very clearly that even when we are faithless, God is faithful. That is a beautiful verse of scripture, that when we are faithless, he will remain faithful for he cannot disown himself. Beautiful, wonderful promise of God. In fact, this verse shows us and should encourage us and give us peace knowing that God is faithful in all situations and that it does not depend on how good I am, It doesn't depend on whether or not I make the right decisions. It doesn't even depend on how much he loves me or him even wanting to be faithful to me because this verse shows me that he's not being faithful just to be faithful to me. He's being faithful because he cannot disown himself. So he is faithful because that's who he is. I've said it many times. One of his names is literally faithful with a capital F. That is his name. So he is going to be faithful 
the, the, the perk on our side is that we just get to be recipients of that faithfulness. But that's always who he's going to be, and that's always who he will be forever and ever. So what choices are we expected to make in response to God's faithfulness? Because we have to make choices, and it's not always exactly what God would want, but what are, what are the expectations? How should we be choosing and making decisions in our life? You see in my text verse that Joshua told the Israelites, after they had seen God's faithfulness for so long, he exhorted them and he said, serve the Lord with all faithfulness. So our call in life in response to his faithfulness is to serve him in faithfulness and to give our lives to him and to trust him with our lives. He says to choose who you will serve. He says, but for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. It's not really a choice, but he's telling them, hey, listen, be intentional, make your choice to serve God. That's the response we are to have for the faithfulness of God. Because see, we all serve something. Every one of us, it's not an option. You're either serving Jesus or you're serving your wallet or you're serving some relationship or you're, you're serving something in your life. And Joshua is saying here, serve the Lord. See, the choice that we've made to serve Jesus is huge. Many of us in this room and even those watching online, you've made a choice to serve Jesus. That's a big deal. And that's the most important choice you'll ever make. As I said, I made in the 90s. But even after we choose to serve Jesus, there's more after that. We're still making decisions all the time after that. How do we honor God with our decisions after we choose to serve him? We see from Joshua what he's telling the Israelites or when he, you know, he's telling them to serve Jesus. If you know the backstory of all of that, you know that the Israelites were held captive in Egypt for over 400 years as slaves. And God said he was going to deliver them and he did and he was faithful to it. He delivered them out into the wilderness but if you know the story, you know that that generation that came out of Egypt, none of them actually got to go into the promised land except for Joshua and Caleb. It's very interesting when you think about this because God was faithful, but their response to his faithfulness determined how that faithfulness looked in their life. God was still faithful. He said, I'm bringing Israel out of Egypt and I'm gonna bring them into the promised land, and he did it. But because of their grumbling and complaining, because of their worshiping a golden calf, their, the way God's faithfulness looked to them was not the fulfillment of what they would have wanted. But even in the midst of that, he was still faithful because he provided for them food and water and, and he provided shade in the, in the daytime. He provided a fire for warmth and guidance in the nighttime. He was still faithful, but how they responded and the choices they made determined how that faithfulness looked in their life. Because if they had come out of Egypt and they'd have been happy and rejoicing and praising God and, and obeying God and and doing what God had told them to do, they would have been the ones to go into the promised land. Yet God had to wait for a whole generation to die off before he could fulfill his faithfulness to these people in their life. And he's this, it's the same way with us. Our choices determine how God's faithfulness looks to us. He's always faithful, but we have to make sure that we're making choices that come from a place of honoring and serving him. So how do I know if I'm making good choices in my faith? How do we know? Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's much more subtle. For most of us, it's probably a lot of subtleties in our life, choices we make that don't necessarily honor him or would maybe make us unsure if we are honoring him. The first thing we have to do is ask ourselves, what is my faith for? If my faith in Jesus is just the ticket to heaven and to maybe get him to help me do some, get out of some situations in my life, then at the very least, we need a perspective change and at the most, you need a complete heart change because your faith is not just meant to be for those things. Our faith is about a life living for him. God wants to transform us. You see, the life of faith, the true life of faith is one of transformation, church. It's a life of transformation. God's faithfulness to you should transform you, not appease you. Now, how does that transformation look? Is it about, is this just a matter of, well, I know what I'm supposed to do, so I'm just gonna work my hardest and grit my teeth to do those things? No, transformation is actually him creating a new person inside of you, him putting his heart in you, making you more like him every day. And there's a verse in Romans 12 that most of you probably know. It's a beautiful passage that, that talks about transformation, but I want you to look at it today in light of God's faithfulness and what the expectation is for us. So in Romans 12, verses one to two, look what the Apostle Paul said here. 
He said, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Everyone say, be transformed. Be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So he's telling us to be transformed here, but he's showing us the, the motivation for this transformation, first of all. He says, in view of God's mercy. Transformation is a byproduct of the life of faith because it is in response to the mercy and the grace of God. We're not being transformed just because that's the right thing to do. It's in response to God's faithfulness in our life. His faithfulness, his mercy in our life is, a, is the power to transform us. It's not just the knowledge, it's also the power in our life to help us to be transformed. Transformation doesn't come from living in such a way that you just want Jesus to save you, but you are actually offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Now this term, living sacrifice, is very, it's paradoxical. It's kind of, it seems like a misnomer in some ways because it seems like it doesn't make any sense because a sacrifice, especially up until the first century, a sacrifice by the Israelites was always bringing an animal to the temple or to the tabernacle, and that animal was killed. If there was a sacrifice brought, it was dead. And now, and, and in the new covenant, because of what Jesus did coming and being that permanent sacrifice for us and dying for us, now the, the sacrifice we bring is not one where we actually die, it's one where we can actually live. Paul is saying, no longer do you need to have dead sacrifices. Now you are a living sacrifice for Jesus. It's such a beautiful thing. We don't have to die. We don't have to bring animals to an altar anymore because that sacrifice has been made once and for all. And now God is saying, because of the sacrifice I made for you, now you be a living sacrifice for me. Now the similarity between the old sacrifice and the new is that in the old, that sacrifice was gonna be completely consumed. There was never anything left of it. It was completely consumed, burned up, given to God as an as a offering to him, as a sacrifice for sins or for some kind of offering, whatever it was. The living sacrifice is also meant to be completely consumed, where we are consumed with Jesus. That we offer ourselves, Paul says, offer yourselves, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the design for us as believers. That's the choice that we are to make as we follow him in response to his faithfulness. What he's saying is, I've been faithful to you. Now I want you to offer yourself to me. Don't just try to be a good person. I want you to give yourself completely to me. There's a, another place, I think it's in Romans, where it says to clothe yourself with Christ, where you are completely enveloped by him. And it's a heart change. It's a, it's a complete transformation of life not just the, the few perks that come from being a Christian in this life. We are meant to be a living sacrifice. This is also why Paul said in Galatians, he said that I am crucified with Christ. He's not literally crucified, we're not literally dying, but he says I'm dying to myself, I'm giving myself as a living sacrifice. He says I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live. Praise God. He's, he's, all he's asking for is our complete and total life, giving it to him, and he will live through us. So, you know what I love about God is that even when we make questionable choices in our life, he's still faithful, amen? He is faithful in every choice we make. There have been times that we have made choices that have been to our detriment, and yet God has shown himself faithful. If you're in a situation where you've made a choice, and it was to your detriment and you haven't seen the faithfulness of God yet, can I tell you today, just hang on, because you're going to see how God's gonna be faithful in the midst of that at some point. Because he's always faithful. Because he cannot disown himself. But anytime we make choices, we know that he is still faithful. And we talked about, we've said that this month we were gonna have video testimonies of people from our very church here that have uh, seen the faithfulness of God. Last week we had a video of the Hudgens who uh, adopted baby Jack and and how God was faithful through that. And today, we have another video of someone here in the church that uh, saw God's faithfulness in their life too. So I'm gonna ask you to watch the screens and then I'll come back.
My name is Wesley Flood, and I always grew up in the church. So God has always been in my life. But me being authentic, I think that's a whole other question. You know, I knew right from wrong, but I still chose to do what I wanted to do. Well, you know, when I was young, we, we was, we grew, I grew up in a more of a low to middle class family. And I got involved with a program called m to m which stood for minority to majority. And that program pretty much bust you from one side of the community to a more affluent community. And there I thrived. But once that program was over and I had to go back to middle school in my area, that's where the trouble began. Um, you know, I started hanging out with kids that um, it was a different type of culture. Being rebellious was the new cool instead of being smart. And, you know, I started to dummy down myself just to fit in. I think that it started to have a domino effect in my life. I saw remnants of me actually, things starting to build and it built and it built. And I think it climaxed when I was 17. Um, a couple of buddies, they wanted a, a wood grain steering wheel for my buddy's car. And we was teenage kids, we didn't have any money. So we decided to go take somebody else's steering wheel. Well, that didn't go well for us. Um, we got caught and then we went to jail for that. The amount of money because of the damages, they actually gave me a felony. And now, so now you're 17, you have a felony. How do you get out of this situation? That's what God really showed up in my life. Like just even in those situations when like things could have went south really bad, he had his hand over my life. I decided, yes, I was gonna live for Christ because I had nowhere else to turn. I mean, I knew I couldn't get out of my bind by myself. So I decided to read the Bible from cover to cover. That was one of the things I did. And, and I did it, but even as I was reading, I would get upset because I knew that I would be held accountable for the words that I read. It was kind of like my ignorance would save me from the truth. Really, I was looking at the things that I had to give up. I wasn't focused on the benefits. And I think that the benefits, as I matured in my faith, the benefits totally outweighs the things that I thought were important at that time. I just started to take responsibility for my actions. And God, he totally turned my life around at that point. He actually led to me to meet a lawyer who learned my story. And I was just at the wrong place at the wrong time, literally. Um, but she was able to get my record expunged. And now I currently work at a nuclear power plant and I have a Department of Energy clearance, which is a high level clearance. So the fact that he was able to work that out for me, I would say that um, I'm all in. I'm all in. Your road will be rough and you will have trials and tribulations. Um, making that decision is not a silver bullet to a good life. I'm gonna keep it real and honest um, because you still got to live daily. But he refines you and when you receive Christ, you receive the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, kindness. And the last one is something that you have to do, which is self-control. So I would say that you have to do your part and God will do his. Amen. We appreciate so much Wesley being willing to, to uh, sit down with us and let us uh, record that and him being transparent. God is so good. He's so faithful and so good. And uh, I'm just so thankful for the faithfulness of God even when we make choices that are less than stellar in our life, which we have all done uh, many times over. God is so good. And our but our choices do matter. And uh, I just, I wanna give you a few reasons why today that I believe that it is so important to understand that our choices matter. I wanna start with saying and telling you that your choices will prove God or prove your doubt. Your choices will either prove God or prove your doubt. Is your life, is your faith proving God or is it proving doubt is in the driver's seat of your life? 
There's a, uh, there's a, lot, of way, a lot of significant decisions that we make in life. And one litmus for whether or not you're living by doubt or by faith, if you're proving God or proving doubt, is when you have to make a significant decision, I'm not talking about where to go to eat, I'm talking about things that will affect your life long term. When you have to make that decision, do you pray before you make it or do you pray after you make it? In other words, do you pray before or do you ask God for discernment and wisdom and knowledge and, and let him speak to your heart to help you make the decision based on his plan for your life or do you just do it, whatever you think you wanna do and then ask God to bless it afterwards? That will tell you because doubt is what keeps us from really submitting it to our God in the first place. If we submit it before him, it's because there's a level of trusting him. There's a level of, well, he might want me to do something I don't wanna do, I really want to do this, and what if God says the other, and I don't know if I can trust him. So we allow doubt to be in the driver's seat in our life making the decisions, and our choices will prove if that doubt is running the show or if it isn't running the show. And you cannot do this and, and let doubt run the show and expect your faith not to waver because your faith actually gets stronger as we trust God on the front end, not on the back end. If we're trusting God on the back end, by now we're in a situation where we need some help and what that actually does is feed your doubt because you can rationalize it in your head that well, God didn't help me and he's not doing what I need him to do so now I don't know if he really cares or I don't even know if he was really real or maybe he's just not good. If you want your faith to grow, you have to bring God in on the front end of the decisions you make and be obedient to what he is leading you to do. I heard somebody say not too long ago that letting doubt guide us is like sitting in a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you're really not going anywhere in your faith. You're just kind of sitting there. And that's exactly what doubt will do in our life. And I, I've said it many times, and I'm sure you've heard it many times, is that we have got to be intentional to fight against doubt in our faith every single day. Every single day. I compare it to brushing my teeth. It's not necessarily something I like to do, but I know there will be some bad consequences if I don't. And if we don't attack and fight against doubt intentionally in our life every day, we're gonna end up having rotten faith because doubt can be subtle in our life. We can, we can even disguise it as discernment or just being prudent or cautious when reality is you're just letting doubt have its way in your life. And God's plan for you is not that you would allow doubt to have its way and to continue to be in the driver's seat of your life. In fact, this whole series we're doing is really one of the main thrusts of it is to combat doubt in our life. That is, we, we have this echo chamber where we're constantly talking about meditating on and remembering the faithfulness of God in our life. It pushes out that doubt. I know for me, anytime I'm dealing with doubt in my life, what I need to do and what I often do is I will sit down and I will meditate on the goodness of God in my life and where I've seen his faithfulness. And it's amazing what happens to doubt when you start doing that. The faith starts rising and the doubt starts falling because you're thinking about how the God's faithfulness not allowing the doubt to be in the front. How many of you remember a time where God showed himself faithful to you in like an epic way? where it was just one of those moments where it was, it was like a miracle or God gave you some incredible insight into a situation or he inspired you to do something. You just knew in your heart God was telling you to do something. You did it. He met you there and showed you that it was the right thing and it was this big, glorious, aha moment and it was wonderful and powerful. We probably, if you've been serving Jesus for any amount of time, every one of us probably have moments like that in our life. And we think back to those times, right? We rejoice in those times. They're wonderful and glorious and powerful. What was your response in that time when those things happened? I can tell you mine, when it's happened to me, and it's happened to me a number of times, when it happens to me, my response goes something like this. God, now I know. Now I know that you're good. Now I know that you're faithful. I know that you're powerful. I know that you love me. I know that you can speak to me and I can follow your leading. And God, this is the greatest thing and I'm so excited and I'm going to live on this mountain forever and never doubt again. That's been my response. And then what happens? You doubt again. Not too long after that sometimes. We'd probably be, ashamed, we'd probably be uh, embarrassed to say sometimes how quickly we go from that mountaintop to the valley. We find ourselves down in that valley. And can I tell you today, church, that's okay. It's okay to find yourself in a valley. We are not valley proof by being Christians. You're not valley proof. 
David was a man after God's own heart, served God, loved God, walked with God. And he wrote Psalm 23 where he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. David was in the valley many, many, many times. If you read Psalms, one of the, you know, Psalms is kind of funny sometimes because, you know, half the Psalm will be like him rejoicing and praising God for his goodness. And the next half, he's like, I want to die. I'm going to go kill somebody. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it was up and down. He was in the valley too. But notice David said, though I walk through the valley and stay there. One of the biggest dangers in the life of a Christian is sitting in the valley and waiting for God to bring you back to a mountaintop. That is a horrible pit that we can live in where we make all of our decisions on life based on the fact that we're in a valley. Because let me tell you what, what's prevalent in the valley a lot of times is the doubt. Because that, that epic moment you had that you thought you'd never doubt again, it's like the doubt comes at you even harder. It makes you wonder, if, well, when I felt that up there, was that even real? Was that just me having a really good day? Maybe my team won that day, so anything that happened was gonna be good. And you start to doubt. And what happens is if you just sit in that valley waiting for the, the huge epic moments, what you're doing is you're letting doubt guide your life. I wanna tell you something today, church. The plan of God is not for you to live up on the mountaintop. It's not even his plan for you. We cannot live our life just waiting and expecting the mountaintop all the time. Now, do we pray for the mountaintops and believe for them? Absolutely. God gives those to us. And we've, like I said, most of us, or maybe all of us in here have had those in our life. But that is not God's plan for your life to live on the mountaintop. And I can prove it because if you live on the mountaintop, you don't have to live by faith. We are called to live by faith. If you live on the mountaintop, you're living by emotions. You're living by sight. And Paul was very clear in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are to live by faith, not by sight. It says in three different places in the New Testament, Hebrews, Romans, and one of the epistles, I don't remember which one, but it says that the righteous shall live by faith. We're not living by sight, we're living by faith. And if you're on the mountaintop, you don't have to have faith. God wants you to have faith more than he wants you to live up high all the time. That's the way it is in a fallen world that we live in. The key is that when we're in the valley, that we don't stay there. That we don't just sit there waiting for God to bring us to that next place, but that we continue to trust him, that we continue to walk with him. We don't sit in the valley, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's God's heart for you and for me. One of the most dangerous traps we fall into is to be obsessed with those exceptional moments in our faith. It's good to have them, it's good to want them, but we cannot let that be an obsession in our life where anything other than that is not sufficient for us because you run the risk of really living in a valley for a long, long time, okay? So our choices will prove God or prove our doubt. The next one is that our choices will reveal our heart. They will reveal our heart. Your choices show you if you are a living sacrifice. They will show you if your heart is really transformed because your your heart is, is very strong. It is hard to not follow your heart if your heart is not transformed, right? Our heart leads us more than we would want to admit in a lot of cases. And uh, it's, a, it's a great litmus for us. In fact, uh, I found a quote from the, the great 19th century uh, preacher, Charles Spurgeon. In fact, we're gonna share it on the screen because it was so good. I want you to just follow along as I read it. He said that true religion begins then with the heart. And the heart is the ruling power of manhood. You may enlighten a man's understanding and you have done much, but as long as his heart is wrong, the enlightenment of the understanding only enables him to sin with a greater weight of responsibility resting upon him. That is so, so good because that's exactly what happens. I have lived that in my life and you probably have too. In other words, what he's saying here, if your faith is just about what you do and what you know, All it's gonna do is make you feel bad when you sin. That's all it's gonna do. He has to have your heart. He has to have it. I lived most of my younger years doing exactly what Charles is saying here, that God had my my head, my understanding, and I did a lot of things. We talked about this last week, that there's three main aspects to your faith, your head, your heart, and your hands. And if God only has your head and your hands and not your heart, it's just religion. That's all it is because he doesn't want us to do the things that, that we're supposed to do in our faith and just fill our head with knowledge. He wants our heart. And the choices we make 
will determine what our heart is and if it is really transformed. Because when we give our heart to Jesus, he changes it, church. He changes our heart. If you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, your heart, your, your motivation, your, your approach to life, how you respond to things, how you react, should not look like it did before you knew Jesus. And if it does, then you haven't given him your heart. He wants our heart. In fact, the great prophet Ezekiel prophesying the coming of Jesus, hundreds of years before he actually came, said in Ezekiel 36, this is the word of the Lord through Ezekiel. He said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Praise God. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's what he does for us when we, when we give ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. You know, you can say a prayer of salvation and you can go to church and you can do things and you can read your Bible and never have given God your heart. Never have done it. And you'll know it because you, you won't look different. A, a changed heart changes everything. It changes your countenance. You look different when Jesus changes your heart. I've heard so many stories of people that give their salvation testimony of how they gave their life to Jesus and they went back into their workplace and people at their work looked at them and said, what's going on with you? You look different. You're freaking me out. <laughs> because that's what happens when we give him our heart. He changes us. We respond differently to situations. We act differently. We, we stop cussing and, and getting drunk. And it's not just because it's the right thing to do. It's because the Lord's changing our heart and we want to honor him now. I'm not just following a list of rules. I'm living for Jesus. There's a big difference, even though the outward look is subtle. He wants our heart. And uh, Isaiah 29, this is the person that doesn't give God his heart. He's rebuking, God's rebuking the Israelites. He's saying, these people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. So their head and their hands, they're given to God but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up of rules taught by men. He can, God can see right through it. We might fool people, but we're not fooling God. Our heart reveals who and what we are really worshiping in our life. And you know, your, uh, your choices do reveal what you believe, but the untransformed heart is so sinister, it can get you to do things contrary even to what you believe. In fact, even the transformed heart has a tendency to do that. None of us have a perfectly transformed heart, right? We're all in process. But even in a transformed heart, your heart will lead you to do things that go against what you truly believe and know to be true. Happens all the time. I mean, just even on a superficial level. I believe wholeheartedly, no question about it, that eating badly will negatively affect my health. Yet I still will slam a bowl of ice cream at 9.30 at night. And I know I'm gonna pay for it. You know, there's a day, you know, when I was a teenager, I could eat six tacos at midnight and go to bed and everything was fine. If I eat six tacos anytime now, I'm, I'm in trouble. But we do it, don't we? We do things that we know and believe will be actually hurtful to us physically. We do it spiritually too. Because our heart wants what it wants and sometimes the cravings for instant gratification are stronger than actually following what we know to be true. That's how sinister the heart is. We have to recognize that. You do not have a good heart on your own. None of us do. It has to be transformed daily by offering, as Romans 12 says, offering yourself as a living sacrifice. That's the only option to having a transformed heart where your heart will not lead you astray every day of your life. It's the only option is to give yourself to him and to trust him with your life completely and totally. Thank the Lord. All right, third and finally, your choices have consequences, but they do not define you. So this is the good news. We make bad choices, obviously, and they do have consequences. Your choices have consequences. But church, listen to me. They do not define you. You are not defined by your bad choices. That's how Wesley can get up there and share a testimony on this huge screen for everybody to see is because he knows that his bad choices that he made when he was a teenager do not define him. We are defined 
by being children of the king. We are defined by being heirs and co-heirs with Christ because of what he did for us. That's it. That's what is defining us. They have consequences, but they don't define us. We've all made dumb decisions. Some of us more recently than others probably. Some of you maybe even yesterday or even this morning. It does not define you. It can veer you off course, but it cannot limit God's ability to bring you back. It cannot stop God from bringing you back. It is absolutely amazing what God can do with a repentant heart. Absolutely beyond words that I could ever muster up from a stage, what God can do with a repentant heart is off the chart and innumerable and without words. That's how amazing he is. Every one of us, if all of our sins were laid bare before all of us in this room this morning, we would all have heart attacks because every one of us has a lot of stuff that has happened that we've done or thoughts we've had or things we've said or thought, whatever, that we know if it was laid out, we'd be embarrassed. We wouldn't deserve Jesus. We wouldn't deserve salvation. We wouldn't deserve anything good in life. And the reason that you are a follower of Jesus and that you are walking in the grace and mercy of God is because of what he did for you in spite of those things. That's it. That's what we have to stand on. That's what we have. Now, I love what Jeremiah said. The prophet Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. This is one of the, the best verses in all the Bible, one of my favorites, honestly. But I wanna, I wanna unpack it a little bit today, look at it a little, a little more than oftentimes we sing about or maybe hear. In Lamentations 3, verses 19 to 23, he says, I remember my affliction and my wandering." the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Everyone say, I have hope. Here's what he's calling to mind to give him hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Can somebody praise God in here this morning? Thank the Lord. (laughs) Hallelujah. Man, we love this verse, don't we? We, we always focus on the last part of this verse, but if you read verse 19, he says, I remember my affliction and my wandering. That word means straying off. That means making bad decisions. That means being selfish and following his fleshly heart. He said, I remember my wandering, but I have hope. Why does he have hope? Well, he goes, he lists the things, the reasons he has hope. He says, his love is great. His love is great because he's faithful. Then he says, we're not consumed. We're not consumed because he is faithful. He goes on, his compassion, some versions say his mercies never fail. They never fail because he is faithful. They are new every morning. There's a fresh batch of mercy for us every single day. And the reason it's there is because God is faithful. And then he finishes it off by saying, great is his faithfulness. His faithfulness is great because that's who he is. Because he is faithful in our wandering. He's faithful in our mess ups. He's faithful in all the stuff we've done. There is absolutely no place in the life of a Christian for shame. No place. You need to hear this today, church. There is no place, not even immediately after you just did something really ridiculous. Shame is never, ever, ever of God. Now, shame is not the same thing as remorse or regret or conviction. Those are are good. Shame is that thing that hovers over you and just makes you keep your head down, where you just don't want anybody to see or you just don't feel worthy of anything. That's shame. Shame is a tool. It's actually a very effective tool of your enemy. He uses it constantly in our lives. And let me just say today, and I don't mean this to to beat on you or anything like that. I want you to understand that if you are living with shame and you are a Christian, that you are not walking in the understanding of the word of God, and you're definitely not walking in the understanding of the power of the cross. Because Jesus took our shame on the cross. That's part of what he did was to take the shame. In fact, the prophet Daniel in in Daniel 12 talks about hell and he says that shame is actually one of the aspects of hell. That people that go to hell, that's one of the things they're gonna be dealing with is shame. Because that's exactly what the enemy does. He comes to bring shame because shame beats us down and it makes us not walk in this life of faith. It, walks, it causes us to not remember the faithfulness of God. All we're doing is we're being narcissistic and thinking about myself and how bad I messed up and how horrible of a person I am. When Jesus is sitting there saying, I took that for you, 
I want repentance, I don't want shame. We have no reason to live in shame. So if that's you today, and you are living with shame over decisions you made, you're, you're, you're reaping the consequences of those decisions maybe, there's still no place for shame. It is never, ever from God. If God brings it to you, he convicts. Conviction is always meant to restore. Conviction is about restoration. And when we, when we repent and we ask his forgiveness, it is separated as far as the east is from the west. It is not remembered anymore. It is gone. John, 1 John 1, 9 says that he purifies us, that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what he does. So there's, there's no reason to even have shame. You can't, you can't even go to God and say, oh, I'm so ashamed. I, I feel so much shame. God, if, you, if you've been forgiven of it, it's gone. You can't even talk about it with God anymore because he's saying, I, there's nothing for me to even do. You just need to not feel shame because it's no place for it in the life of a believer. His mercies are new every single morning in our life. And listen, let me close with this. It takes faith to fall down and to get back up. It doesn't take faith to fall. We're all good at that. It takes faith to fall down and get back up. In fact, Proverbs 24 says that a good man, a righteous man, falls seven times and gets back up. Not a, a screw up, not a bad person, not a heathen, a righteous man falls seven times. You're going to fall. You're going to fall. Whether it's in your mind, whether it's thoughts you're having, whether it's decisions you're making, you're going to fall. If you're a righteous man, you're gonna fall and you're gonna get back up. But it takes faith to do that. Faith is in God's ability to be faithful in your life, not in your ability to be sorry enough. Listen, I've been there, I lived that. Where if I messed up, I had to beat myself up for, you know, depending on the severity of what I did, I might have to beat myself up for a few days, it might be a week. If it was really bad, maybe a month. Because I felt like if I feel bad and I just beat myself up, then I won't do it again. Probably all of you have been there too. Guess what? That is completely contrary to what we're called to do. We're not called to beat ourselves up after, after we've done something. If, if God says it's forgiven and it's separated from, as far as the east is from the west and you have a clean slate and I've purified you from all unrighteousness, there's nothing to beat yourself up about anymore. And beating yourself up doesn't keep you from doing it again because what you're doing is you're not receiving those new mercies that are new every day. It's bringing shame on you and I'm telling you, and you guys know this too, the shame can settle in, and it can root in, and it can be very difficult to get it out if it's rooted in deep enough because you don't even know how to live after a while. You don't know how to live anymore without feeling shame because you don't feel like you deserve to live any other way than in shame. Completely backwards from what God did for you and for me. The power of the cross takes away our shame, and the, and the, the righteous person is going to fall but they're going to get back up by the grace of God. That's the only reason you can get back up, not because you feel bad enough, but because of him and how good he is in your life. Your choices matter and they have consequences, but they don't define you. His grace and his mercy defines you and your life, amen? Would you stand with me please as we close? I wanna pray for us today. And I just ask you to open your heart, church, as we pray. Let the Lord minister to you. If you need to release anything to him today, release it. Don't hold on to it. It can be done today. If you've been dealing with shame for months or years maybe, it can be completely over today. You just stand on the truth. You stand on who he is. You confess your wandering and then you stand on his mercy. It's really that simple. The choices you made yesterday have had a part in determining who you are today. But the really good news is that the, the choices you make today will determine who you will be in the future. You don't have to be the person you, the, that made the decisions that caused maybe some trouble in your life today. There's always a future for those of us, especially in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together, church. Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for your mercy and your grace. Lord, I thank you that you are so, so faithful in our life. Lord, I thank you that we are not consumed, that we are not consumed by our own sin, we're not consumed by our own life, Lord, but you have called us 
to come up and rise above those things in our life and to stand on your mercy. We thank you that your mercy is there for us every single day. And God, we know that all you ask of us is that we would offer ourselves as living sacrifices, that we would be crucified with you, yet we would live. God, let that be our heart. God, where we have not allowed you to have that much access into our life, God, would you help us today to give you that full access, that we would live lives fully surrendered to you, Jesus. God, I thank you today that there is no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray today for each person under the sound of my voice that's been dealing with shame, maybe has a root of shame in their life, don't even know how to live without feeling shamed. God, we come against that today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we speak truth over it, that they are not shamed, but that they are heirs and co-heirs with Christ, that we are children of the King, that the power of the cross has delivered us from all shame. It's delivered us from all condemnation. It's delivered us from all of our sin. And we can walk in confidence and come boldly into your throne room because of what you have done for us. And we thank you for it today, God. We cut off that shame today in the name of Jesus. The enemy will not use that against any of us anymore. And we will be intentional to every day stand against shame, to stand against doubt, to stand against sin, to stand against our own flesh nature, and to let you change our heart and transform us. Transform us for your glory, God. For your glory, Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much. We bless you and we honor you today. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Can we praise God one more time? Thank you, Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God.